um, I hope you enjoyed the first uh, first part of the conference. Uh, I found it to be very, very interesting. Um, we have two more uh, speakers before the next uh, question. Uh, before before we take uh, in the, the next question break. Um, before I introduce the next speakers, I would just like to um, say to you that, um, first of all, uh, we would really appreciate if you could post the questions in the Q&A because it's much easier for us to follow what's being asked if it's in, in the Q&A. Uh, and please keep your mics on mute. Um, and if I forgot to mention anything else, Sandra, please feel free to uh, to jump in. Um, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Ch Charton Eferik, and please correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> um, and he is a principal scientist at Lundbeck in the Department of Circuit of Biology, I think it's pr pronounced. Um, and he will be talking a bit about the EG and behavioral research data on pharmacological modulation of NMDA receptors, including BLUN2B selective modulation. Really interesting things. And the speaker after Dr. Charton is Jenny Lee, and she's um, a mom uh, of a child with another rare genetic disorder. And she's been a very, very, very active part of our Green Research discussion group on Facebook and, and has a wealth of knowledge. And we are really looking forward to hearing from both of you. So, um, Charton, you can take over now. OK, thank you. I'll try to share my screen. Uh, it should come up now. Can you see my screen? Yes, looks great. So, good. Uh, we'll need a pointer. Okay, well, um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great honor to uh, be part of this uh, meeting. I've, I'm really impressed by the, the talk so far. I've actually learned a lot, and um, and I think they've uh, helped me a lot uh, because it, it, I can jump right into uh, what I want to talk about. <clears throat> yes. Um, so my name is Katzen Herrick, and uh, I work at at Lundbeck, and I will present some of the the data that we have uh, uh, we've uh, made at the uh, at Lundbeck. Uh, it's both uh, behavioral research and uh, an EEG. Uh, I have a little bit of uh, both uh, preclinical and clinical EEG that I would like to share with you. Um, and first of all, I, I think I need uh, to put a, a disclaimer. So I, I do work at a, at a company, a drug company. Uh, our purpose is to, to restore brain health. Uh, that's very simple. Uh, actually, it's, it's really, really difficult and we've, we're fighting uh, the best we can. Um, but to my knowledge, we don't have a, a treatment option that, uh, that we can offer uh, green patients, I'm afraid. But what I can is that I can, I can tell you how we work uh, at Lundbeck, how we work with the NMDA receptor, uh, or examples of how we work. Um, and as you may see in the background of, of me, I'm, uh, I'm in Copenhagen. Uh, I work in the headquarters in, in Valby, uh, but uh, Lundbeck is, is all over the world. Um, uh, but the headquarters are here in, in uh, Copenhagen. So um, I, I put down the, the questions that I thought were the, the most uh, important to discuss, at least from, from my perspective. So first of all, I, I would like to tell you why uh, I've, I studied the NMDA receptor, um, because I come from a, a slightly different angle uh, than, than you guys, I think. Uh, and I, I would like to stress how important the site of, of action is um, when modulating the, um, the NMDA receptor. And also uh, why timing is of importance. Um, and I would like to come into why this uh, or how the, the data that we have constructed translate to, uh, to humans. Um, so. In the end, I think we can discuss uh, how a brief inhibition of the NMDA receptor is relevant for green patients. But I'm sorry, I have to throw out my son. I'm, I'm working from home as so many other people are. Uh, excuse me for that. Okay. Um, so I also made a, a drawing of the uh, NMDA receptor. Um, and uh, I hope that you 
know it so well that I, I don't need to spend too much time on it. But what I want to, to stress again is uh, how we came into this. I was really uh, fascinated by the, uh, the, the antidepressant effects that, uh, that ketamine has been shown to have in, in treatment resistant patients. And uh, ketamine is, is blocking the NMDA receptor pore, just as <clears throat> other pore blockers you, you heard about uh, Mimantin earlier today. Um, and what ketamine is doing in these uh, treatment resistant patients is that it has a really rapid acting antidepressant effect, but it's also inducing um, psychotomic side effects. Um, so this is the effect of, of blocking the pore. There's also the proteal side uh, that you've also seen before today. Here, this is uh, selectively uh, on NR2B subunits of the NMDA receptor. And there are some compounds that, uh, that, that can uh, negatively uh, modulate uh, the receptor through this uh, site. Um, they have also shown to have antidepressant uh, efficacy, but not without the psychotomimetic side effects. Um, we know less about these, so we don't know how they affect uh, sleep, for instance, or, or motor um, uh, behavior. And then, as you've seen before today, there's the glycine side uh, where D-serine is, is uh, binding. Here, another uh, type of compounds, uh, one that I will mention uh, today is uh, D-cycloserine um, binds. And so uh, D-cycloserine is a partial agonist. So that means that it is less effective uh, as serine uh, or glycine at the site. Uh, so in the way we study uh, the receptor, we actually use it to inhibit um, the function of, of the NMDA receptor. So all these tools that, that I'm, I'm using, they are functionally inhibiting uh, the NMDA receptor. So it's, it's like a loss of function. But even if it, it's all loss of function, it may have many different uh, outcomes. So this is what I, I really want to, uh, to show you. And, and uh, in the depression field, the hypothesis is that just a brief uh, functional inhibition of the NMDA receptor that may drive long-lasting antidepressant uh, efficacy. Good. So this brings us to the importance of, of timing. So um, NMDA receptor inhibiting compounds, they have acute effects that are uh, induced by compound in the brain targeting the NMDA receptor, but they also have uh, long-lasting effects that, that last even if the compound has, has left the brain uh, and make uh, permanent changes to the brain. So when we study the acute effects, we may just inject the compound and look at how uh, a rodent behaves in a box, um, but we may also do more challenging um, tasks. So we can look at, at balance, for instance, we can uh, challenge with uh, uh, inducing seizures or uh, look at brain waves with EEG. This is good for the acute effects. When we study the prolonged effects, uh, we can uh, take out the brain and look at the at brain slices uh, at many different uh, times after one dose of the, of the compound. And uh, there's also a, a behavioral test where, uh, um, where rats are, or mice uh, swim in a in a pool of water, and, and this may actually uh, also be affected um, by, by just one dose of, of the compounds. So what I will uh, tell you about today is uh, the effect of, of a single uh, dosing of uh, one of these compounds. So if we uh, take the basal locomotor activity uh, first, uh, we uh, often, we, all of our studies that I'm going to show here in the presentation are, are done in, in, in rats, humans. Uh, so what we do here is just uh, taking a rat, injecting a compound, and then put it in a box, uh, watching what's happening. Um, in these boxes, there are photo beams, so movements of the rats are, are counted. Uh, and this is what you can see here in these uh, figures. You see the count of, of movement. And um, uh, it's, is that a question or no? Okay. Um, so uh, we, when we dose different doses of ketamine that blocks the pore, 
then the high dose uh, of the highest dose we tested would induce hyperactivity. And this would also be the case that uh, you had actually long-lasting increases in activity levels uh, by a compound that selectively inhibit the NR2B uh, receptor uh, subunit. Um, but when modulating the glycine side, it did not affect motor behavior. And um, of course, this, the effects of, of ketamine and, and the MK0657 compound look very different, but that has also to do with um, the time the compound is in the brain. So it's, it's actually uh, mimicking uh, the exposure of compound in the brain. So we can also challenge the, uh, the rats by, by putting them on a, a wooden beam and ask them to, <clears throat> to balance and cross the beam. And um, we did this also for, for the three types of compound. Um, and uh, ketamine, at, at a dose that did not affect uh, basal locomotion levels, uh, seriously, um, disabled the, the, the rats so that they could not balance. So what you see in the, in the gray uh, column is how many time the, times the rat slipped when it's uh, uh, trying to pass the beam. And sometimes they even fell off the, uh, the wooden beam. They don't fall that far, I can tell you. Uh, and at the highest dose, they could not even uh, walk. So, so that is seriously affecting uh, the balance of, of the rats. On the other hand, the uh, in our 2B, uh, subunit uh, blocking agent uh, did not have any effect on balance. Um, and uh, if anything, these rats, they seem to be more alert and uh, they were faster to cross the beam. With the glycine side partial action, agonist, the G-cyclosurin, um, they seem to be more relaxed and slightly sedated at the high dose. Um, uh, but they but they uh, did pretty well even at the highest dose um, where they got uh, so contrary to to uh, to the uh, two B nan they they were more sedated whereas the the two B nan made them more alert um, yes so we also uh, often uh, test compounds like this on uh, the uh, uh, the protective effect on, on uh, induced seizures. So there's a test called the maximum electroshock threshold test, where you test the anticonvulsant efficacy of a compound. Um, and this is very sensitive to NMDA receptor inhibition. So even if uh, green patients may have epilepsy, the acute effect of blocking the NDA receptor uh, is actually protective uh, towards uh, 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 convulsion. Um, so here, both uh, ketamine and uh, and decyclosurin. So this is for ketamine uh, dose response. So the higher the dose of ketamine, the more it protects against seizures. Uh, and here it's a, a time series. So it shows how the effect wears off with time. Uh, over here we have um, the uh, decyclosurin, so there's also a dose response effect of decyclosurin, uh, and that wears off but slower. Um, so, so uh, by inhibiting the NMDA receptor, we protect against uh, convulsions acutely, and this is only while the compound is uh, on the target. So this brings us to uh, to EEG. So this is a it's, it's more time consuming to construct these experiments. Uh, you have to uh, uh, go through surgery with these rats to implant electrodes in the brain. So I'm trying to show you with this primitive movie how we put a screw in the skull to record EEG, or uh, ECOG it's also called uh, here. And then we also put some electrodes deep into the brain to record the, the activity. And um, this, is of course not how it really looks, but it's uh, to symbolize what's going on. So here are uh, pyramidal neurons uh, firing uh, action potentials, and this is um, recorded by the electrodes, um, and it's uh, uh, acquisition, uh, acquisition by our acquisition system. And these signals uh, we treat in different ways, uh, uh, filtered, 
uh, to either get the activity of one single neuron or populations, uh, so of, uh, thousands of neurons. And uh, we try to look into how uh, the oscillatory activity in, in at uh, different wavelengths things are uh, change with, with uh, time. And uh, normally it's it's quite uh, stable. Uh, so this is a uh, what we do, we construct heat plots uh, where uh, blue is uh, low activity and, and red is uh, high amplitude activity. Um, but then with the, if we give a compound a challenge, then we see changes uh, in the different frequency bands. So you have, for instance, more fast oscillations and, and less uh, slow oscillations. And, and uh, we normally uh, baseline normalize this to, to make the effects even clearer. Um, so this movie was uh, made by one of uh, my former colleagues who's, uh, who was uh, very nice to, to, to help us out here. Um, so th these are examples of these uh, heat plots where we compare uh, ketamine and desiderin and, uh, and another compound called the DOI. Uh, it's actually uh, closely related to LSD. And as you see, it's like they have different fingerprints, these compounds. Um, but what's in common is that um, they all uh, induce uh, high frequency oscillations, that's the HFO. So these are uh, fast oscillations around 150 um, oscillations per second. Um, what is different is that, for instance, ketamine is, is increasing uh, gamma oscillations. Those are from 30 to 60 hertz, and it's inhibiting uh, lower frequency oscillations between 10 and 20 hertz. So this here, you can clearly differentiate between uh, ketamine effects and, and decycloserin effects. Um, so here I'll try to uh, put the, the three different types of uh, modulation against each other. Um, so because uh, we, we put uh, an accelerometer on the head of the, the rats, uh, we also get an activity readout from our um, EEG experiments. So we always have a, a baseline of half an hour, then we inject compound. Uh, and that's, also, that's always uh, um, exciting the rats a little bit and they, they'll run around no matter if they get a, a vehicle or like a, a placebo in, injection or they get a real compound. But uh, ketamine only ha has a weak effect on locomotion, whereas uh, the NR2B uh, lamp uh, inhibitor through NR2B really increased the locomotion of, of the rats. Decycloserin did not do much, if anything, slightly inhibit the activity. So then I also uh, I tried to quantify the, the, the uh, low beta uh, inhibition that you saw with the ketamine, the, the, the blue uh, area in the, in the heat plot. So uh, green here is, is ketamine and blue is a vehicle injection. So uh, ketamine clearly inhibits uh, these beta oscillations. Unfortunately, um, this is actually a bit difficult to pick up uh, in, the, in the NR2B and, um, animals because this is only something that we record when the rats are sitting still and the rats were really not very quiet uh, after this injection. So the, the statistics are not very great here, uh, although that I actually think that there is a, a, an inhibition of, of beta oscillations uh, also with the NR2B compound. These cycloserin had no effect. If we then look at the high frequency oscillations, all three compounds increase that. So you can use EEG to differentiate between different types of modulation of the uh, acute effect uh, at, at the NMDA at the receptor. So I'm just uh, trying to sum it up here. So ketamine and uh, the NR2B compound inhibits beta, the serin does not. Uh, ketamine increased gamma, but uh, the two other compounds didn't really significantly do that, uh, but they all increase the higher frequency oscillations. So there are differences in the lower frequency bands, um, but uh, all the compounds share the increase in high frequency oscillations. And these effects are also uh, following the exposure of compound in the brain. So it's acute effects. So now 
we turn to the long lasting effects, prolonged effects. Um, so this is what you can measure after the compound has been washed out. And often we look at 24 hours after a single dose. So uh, this type of experiment is um, a hippocampal rat brain slice. So we have, what we've done is that we inject rats uh, with compound. Then we uh, leave them in their cages for 24 hours. Uh, and then we take the, uh, the brain out, slice it, and we can uh, then in a multi-electrode array system uh, stimulate one area of the brain and record in another area of the brain. And here uh, we've shown that ketamine is um, increasing excitability. So what we record is a few uh, potential and, and this is uh, excited by, by ketamine. So less current is enough to, to induce a, a strong signal here. So ketamine, 24 hours after ketamine injection, where ketamine is completely out of the body, something has changed in the hippocampus. Um, and this we also record with d So uh, both of these compounds, they um, can increase uh, these currents, and they are mediated by AMPA receptors. So, so th this is uh, the, the AMPA receptor somehow taking over uh, because the, the NMDA receptor has been inhibited just for a short while. Uh, then I mentioned this uh, uh, SWIN test, uh, it's uh, called the PASALT uh, SWIN test. Um, it's a rodent behavioral test that has been used for many years to evaluate the effect of uh, antidepressant uh, uh, drugs. So uh, it's not like the, the rat is depressed, uh, but it's, uh, it's stressed by having to swim in a, in a bowl of uh, water. And uh, a coping strategy to this is to just float and relax. Um, but antidepressants have this effect that they make the, the rats uh, swim for longer. And we also tested our uh, compounds here because that is a, it's a good way to show that uh, something has uh, changed uh, in the brain. Um, and, and ketamine is known to have an effect uh, one day after treatment. So again, the dose, leave the rats, and then uh, test them 24 hours later. And both ketamine and uh, decycloserine would decrease the immo immobility uh, 24 uh, hours after dosing that, so it means they, they swim more. Um, the, 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 the contract research organization that, that uh, did these uh, experiments for us uh, also um, tested uh, S-ketamine, so that's uh, one enantiomer of, uh, of ketamine that is very potent. Um, and there they could actually see an effect that lasted at least uh, seven days after one injection of, uh, of ketamine. So just inhibiting the NMDA receptor for a brief uh, period, uh, so less than uh, only a few hours, is enough to, to induce uh, long lasting changes in, in the brain. So uh, this is a very uh, densely populated uh, table. Uh, it's, it's to show um, how the, diff the side of action uh, is important. Uh, so I, I list the different types of assays that we have used. Uh, and, and to help you, uh, I've, I put some boxes around uh, these numbers. So uh, what is in common for all of the, of the compounds that in inhibit the, the activity of the NDA receptor is that they protect in seizures, seizure assays. And they also induce uh, high frequency oscillations. Um, and then they have long lasting effects. And of course, I have not tested the NR2B NAMs here, so I can't really assure, uh, promise you that, that that would also happen. Um, but uh, I've seen other uh, data on this. So then, um, what is the difference? So only the NR2B compounds and the pore blocking uh, agents increase locomotor activity. Uh, this is what you have here. So resting state, EEG, LMA, that's locomotor activity, um, mod R, that's motor uh, activity as well. So that is increased by these compounds. 
uh, and then they also tend to decrease um, the slower oscillations in the EEG. What is special for NR2B uh, negative modulators is that they have absolutely no negative effect on the balance in the, in the beamwalk, whereas ketamine was very disruptive and at high doses, um, D cyclosan was uh, also sedative here. And what is uh, specific for the, the glycine side modulation is that no matter how high you, we, we dose this, uh, this compound, it would never in, induce hyperactivity. So, how does this translate into human behavior or, uh, or EEG for that sake? So um, we, uh, we asked uh, some colleagues at uh, King's College in London to run an experiment for us where they tested two doses of the t 250 milligrams and, and uh, one gram of uh, t uh, against uh, half, a gram, half a milligram of um, ketamine and placebo. So uh, what they did was to place uh, uh, a cap with an EEG cap on, on the healthy volunteers, and then record EEG before dosing, and at the time where both compounds were present uh, in the brain, and then at a later time point where ketamine had been washed out of the brain, but decyclosine would still be present. And then they also did a lot of other tests, uh, for instance, to assess the effect on um, on uh, dissociative uh, side effects. And let's start with the, the psychomimetic effects in healthy volunteers. So um, these two uh, graphs show the effect of d before when d is uh, at uh, its highest concentration in the brain. And then at a, at a later time point, there's no effect on the psychomimetic uh, scores. And ketamine has a really high impact at, uh, when, when it's in the brain, but it is quickly flushed out of the brain. Um, placebo did not really have a, a strong effect. Um, so, so again, here we can differentiate uh, between uh, blocking the pore and, and, the, and the targeting the, the glycine uh, side at the NMDA receptor. So then, uh, the EEG is, I think, really interesting because that really um, show a great uh, translation between the, the, the rat and, and the human. So uh, this uh, orange uh, or reddish line here is, is ketamine, and it inhibits the, the lower frequency, 10 to 20, up to 30 hertz uh, oscillations, just as in the rat. But placebo or d had no effect here, just as in the red. Ketamine is inducing gamma, and that was also strong in, in, the, in the red. Uh, d is not doing that. But again, uh, ketamine and uh, d increase the higher frequency oscillations. So, so this uh, supports that a, a d and a ketamine elicit similar but not identical uh, neurobiological effects, and this is something that we can we can uh, record in in humans. Yeah. So let's uh, return to the uh, the questions from the beginning. Uh, so you know why I was studying the NDA receptor uh, because I was fascinated by this uh, these uh, rapid acting antidepressant effects of uh, NDA receptor uh, antagonists. Um, and I, I tried to show why I think the side of action is so important. So loss of function, that can be many, many different uh, things depending on where you, you hit uh, at the receptor. Um, and then of course, the timing is of importance. What I have studied is only uh, a brief inhibition of the, the NNDA receptor. And this of course does not compare to uh, a genetic uh, deficit. Um, I think for, um, for the EEG, there's a, a very good translation to humans. So uh, this can also, of course, be a back translation. So if you have uh, genetic models of um, 
of, of grid mutations, then perhaps the, there's a good chance that they, they would also translate, this is my uh, belief. And then the, the big question is uh, whether this really translates. And, they, and I guess this is what we should discuss uh, afterwards. So that was uh, what I had to say. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge all my great colleagues at Lundbeck, uh, the people uh, helping in the, in the lab, um, PhD students and uh, uh, department heads, and many more, uh, and the people at King's College uh, who did this really, really important uh, clinical uh, trial. Um, and then uh, our friends in, in Barcelona, uh, Frances, Atikas, and Pau, uh, who were um, supervising Maria. Uh, Ahmad Barasta, uh, a, a great PhD student uh, that is not a PhD student link or anymore, but they're working here at, at Lundbeck. So that was it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Arjan. It was really, really interesting. Um, now, because uh, we are running a little bit of uh, well, past time, I will quickly introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Jenny. Jenny Lee, I hope you're ready because I can see you. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, as I pre previously men mentioned, Jenny Lee, she is um, uh, a mom of a uh, of a child with a different uh, genetic disorder, uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, maybe a more even more complex uh, than our green children. So she has a wealth of knowledge. Um, and over to you, Jenny. Thanks. Let's see. So. So I'm going to start with a small presentation about me, because I think that has uh, some relevancy to my standpoint. Um, and my name is Jenny Lee Oshell, and most of you know me as a very frequent poster at the Green Research Community at Facebook. And some others of you know that I'm the parent of a little girl with SAP-B2 syndrome. Uh, here you can see her. and. Two of the features of Seth B2 syndrome, a broad smile and some odd shaped teeth. Otherwise, the Seth B2 syndrome is pretty similar to uh, green disorders. And there is a link because the Seth B2 gene is expressed in uh, the nucleus of pyramidal cells of the brain. And it regulates a lot of other genes and probably among them the green genes, but we don't know how yet. And I'm very obviously passionate about translating science to treatments. And my little girl here, she is the reason for that. And just for the record, I don't have any kind of medical background. Actually, my story started three years ago when we got this diagnosis. And it's really, really rare. Um, I think there were less than 200 people diagnosed with this when we got her diagnosis. And actually the same week I left my job and started reading up on the literature because I wanted to learn as much as I could about this very rare syndrome. And it took me about two months until I found the link to the green genes and I joined the green community. A year later I thought that it was time to get back to work. And lo and behold, I got a position at the Department of Clinical Neuroscience at my country's top medical university. And after that, I decided to start a SAP B2 research community, just like the one you have for Green. And today we have 350 members, so we're still a, a smaller sibling to your research community. And I also started to contact researchers. In, in the beginning, I had the questions, but after a while, people started to ask me things. Half a year ago, I was asked to co-author my first scientific article on EEG abnormalities in the syndrome. And I actually have another article in the pipeline. So as the cherry on the top today, I'm here as a speaker at the third European Green Conference. And it's been a very exciting journey, of course, but most important is, of course, that I've been able to use insights from my own research to raise the quality of life for my family, 
my kids means the world to me and they are my motivation. So here's my presentation and it's called Beyond the NMD Receptor. And why is that? Well, we've been focusing a lot on this lately. And this is the NMD receptor, and you can see the flow of ions through it and a couple of substances that act directly on it. And it is a great approach. I mean, once we find drugs that can modulate this flow through the receptor, we will be able to help many, many, many green individuals. But there is certain more going on in green than just this receptor and the flow through it. And more, there are many, many ways to look for solutions. Uh, we will get some solutions if we look at green disorders this way as a receptor. But we can look at what the receptor does at the synapse and we will get other solutions. We can look at whole organs and how they interact with others when we, there are mutations. We can look from the outside like a physician and see what kind of solutions can we find for what we see. Um, we can look at behaviors and try to treat those. We could look at EEG abnormalities and try to treat those. Uh, we could take the genetic approach and our solutions will probably be gene editing. We can look at cells in vitro, or we can look at animal models. And it's depending on how we look at brain disorders, uh, we will get different solutions. Another thing I find really, really cool is that almost all disorders that affect cognition, memory, and behavior, they share some mechanisms. And this is regardless if the origin was genetic or is if it was acquired from an injury or caused by an immune hit. And what this means is that rare disorders like green disorders or SAP-P2 syndrome are very similar to other disorders. And it means that treatments for other disorders may apply to green disorders. And we don't have to do everything from scratch. We can save money and time this way. And this is the foundation of a rare parent strategy because a rare parent seldom has a um, research budget or animal models or a lab. We have to be very, very smart. So once we find how our disorder relates to this common mechanism I'm talking about, we can apply a divide and conquer strategy to manage symptoms. And so what are these common mechanisms I'm talking about in brain disorders? Well, I show you a few. And when you look at them from the top, it will look like a scrambled jigsaw of pathological puzzle pieces. So we have disturbed EI balance, oxidative stress, blood brain barrier disruption, neuroinflammation, poor myelination, mitochondrial dysfunction, and so on and so on. There are very many of them. And the great, great question here is how do they all fit together? In fact, I don't believe there is any person in the world who would be able to fully answer that. And there's a lot of scientists who are occupied by trying to find out how they fit together. But there is some consensus on how some of these puzzle pieces fit together. And today I'm going to try and uh, tell you a little bit about these connections. So it's going to be a very brief overview. It's going to be overly simplified, but hopefully relevant for green disorders. And I wanted to start with something we know. We know that the green proteins build up the NMD receptor. And we know that mutations will cause the NMD receptor to dysfunction or be disactivated. And that is our first mechanism. Um, in green disorders, we know it's a dysfunction. 
uh, in other disorders is more about disactivation. And the NMD receptor mediates excitatory signals, but they are also to some extent involved in inhibition. And thus the NMD receptor dysfunction will affect the EI balance. And that is our second mechanism. And the E is, of course, for excitation, which in layman's terms would be something like signaling or messaging or information. And the I is for inhibition. And in layman's terms, that would be noise cancelling. So here you can see a signal. And um, we need excitation for the signal, and we need inhibition to cancel every noise. And we need both of them to be in balance for a clear signal to go through and for proper cognition. So this EI imbalance is a well-recognized cause of epilepsy. And excited toxicity is a lighter version, I would say, than epilepsy. And we see seizures in many brain affected individuals. And that's independently if they have gain of function or loss of function mutations. So the NMD receptor is triggered by glutamate. And in other disorders, too much glutamate is a problem. But is there excessive glutamate in Grimm disorders? We don't know. We can only speculate. We might want less glutamate if we are dealing with a hyperactive receptor. And maybe more glutamate is released to trigger receptors that are underactive or even missing. But we don't know. So the next mechanism I'm going to talk about is oxidative stress, and I'm sure you have heard about it before. It's another kind of imbalance. This time, on the one side, we have reactive oxygen species, and here they are represented by a superoxide anion. It's a free radical, and you can see it by that little red dot, which is an unpaired electron, which makes this molecule very unstable and highly reactive. And on the other hand, we have our antioxidant defenses. And this time I'm uh, representing that with a glutathione molecule. And glutathione is our main antioxidant substance in, in our bodies. So oxidative stress happens when the amount of reactive oxygen species is higher than an organism's ability to neutralize them via its antioxidant defenses. And just for the record, there are a reactive nitrogen species too. I'm not going to talk about them today, but they are very similar. So these reactive oxygen species in excess are mostly bad news because they can do a lot of damage to a cell and its components. It can damage fats through lipid peroxidation. It can damage proteins. And if a reactive oxygen species can travel down to the nucleus and cause base damage or even strand breaks in your DNA. And that's thought as one cause of cancer. So it's really nothing you want for your kid. Oxidative stress happens in all brain disorders. In fact, it happens in all brains too, to some extent, but it's contributing to almost all brain disorders that I know. Um, so what does the literature say about green disorders? Well, we don't have anything on green disorders, but we can look at something that is pretty similar. Here is one article. It says activation of neuronal NMD receptors induces superoxide mediated oxidative stress in neighboring neurons and astrocytes. So this could be relevant if you have a gain of function mutation. Uh, because then you would perhaps have more oxidative stress. And here's another one. It says 
synaptic NMDA receptor activity boosts intrinsic anti antioxidant defenses. Well, that sounds good, unless you have a loss of function mutation, because maybe you will have less antioxidant defenses then. Who knows? And the third one, does the redox balance of the brain acting in no small part via glutathione controls NMDO receptor activity? So it looks like there is a reciprocal um, relationship here between the NMDA receptor and oxidative stress. And I'm gonna add all these uh, relationships to our figure here at the left. Yikes, what is that? Oh, I'm sorry, that is a mitochondrion. And it is our main suspect for production of reactive oxygen species. So let's add mitochondrial dysfunction to our mechanism. So the primary task for mitochondria is to supply our cells with energy. And they do that through a process that is called oxidative phosphorylation. And ATP is uh, the energy unit that our body uses. And this oxidative phosphorylation can be disturbed when too much calcium flows into a cell um, because mitochondria act like sponges for calcium. So think of gain of function mutations or during seizures. And the oxidative phosphorylation can also be disturbed by oxidative stress. And when this happens, mitochondria will start to produce a lot of reactive oxygen species themselves. So we get another couple of uh, relationships here at the left. And note that mitochondrial dysfunction is also a cause of epilepsy. What does the literature say? One article says excessive activation of NMDA receptors in the pathogenesis of multiple peripheral organs via mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress and inflammation. And here's another one. Mitochondrial dysfunction is a primary event in glutamate neurotoxicity. And this one was on the NMDA receptors. So yes, it looks relevant for us. So I'm gonna add another mechanism, it's blood-brain barrier disruption. So what is that? Well, the blood-brain barrier is found at the lining of these thin blood vessels in the brain. Uh, and it's made of a layer of endothelial cells. If you look at the right, it's the violet cells uh, lining the blood vessel. And they are connected by tight junctions. And these endothelial cells are the same type that you will find in your guts. And the blood-brain barrier keeps pathogens, immune cells from the rest of the body and other large molecules, it could be your drug molecules, for example, out of our brains. And it also regulates the inflow of glucose and ketones. So is the blood-brain barrier relevant for brain disorders? Here's one article saying non-unotropic action of endothelial NMDA receptors on blood-brain barrier permeability. And the non-unotropic word here means that this is reg regardless of any flow of ions through the NMDA receptor. Um, so yes, relevant. Let's add a uh, an arrow for that too, to our figure. So seizures is probably the most well-known cause for acute blood-brain barrier disruption. And this is linked to NMDA receptor signaling. If you have chronic epilepsy, it could result in a leaky blood-brain barrier. Oxidative stress is also linked to blood-brain barrier disruption. 
and blood-brain barrier disruption is a part of how myelin gets damaged, at least in one disorder called multiple sclerosis. And we need the space, so I'm going to hide that part for a while. Most important blood-brain barrier disruption will result in neuroinflammatory processes. and increased excitability and risk for new seizures. So what does the literature say about this neuroinflammation? A direct relation between NMDA receptor constant activation and inflammatory cascade activation exists. Chronic brain inflammation leads to a decline in hippocampal NMDA1 receptors. And here we show that peripheral inflammation increased the expression of NMDA, NR2B receptors, and NR2B receptor mediated synaptic currents in the anterior cingulate cortex. That's a part of the brain. So, neuroinflammation. Acutely, it will protect the brain. But when it's sustained, it will cause sickness behavior. It will cause cognitive decline. And in the long term, neurodegeneration. And the brain has its own specialized immune cells that you can't find anywhere else. And they're called microglia. Here's a microglial cell. And um, when it's activated, it will release pro-inflammatory molecules. And you've heard about them before, uh, cytokines. Uh, you've probably heard about them during this pandemic, but then it's other types of immune cells that um, shares these cytokines in our lungs. And the issue, this issue here is that insults such as early life seizures can predispose these microglia to become primed. Uh, or hyper responsive. And the thing is that microglia will stay prime for a very, very long time and they live for a long time, they live for years. And once they are primed, they will react to any kind of inflammatory signal. And I'm using quotes here around the word inflammatory because most of us will think about inflammation as, I don't know, bacterial inflammation. But in the brain, there's also sterile inflammation, which can be caused by a lot of things like epilepsy, oxidative stress, mitochondrial fragmentation, or myelin debris. Even social stress can activate microglia, at least in mice. And microglia will also react to signals that come from the rest of your, our bodies, such as virus infections, allergies, food intolerances, gut issues, and even tooth eruption. And all of this happens uh, frequently in small children. And the thing is, this doesn't have to happen through a blood-brain barrier disruption. There are other ways for these inflammatory signals to go to the brain. Um, via the vagus nerve, for example. Neuroinflammation is a somewhat self-perpetuating process uh, because activated microglia will degrade the blood-brain barrier and they will recruit immune cells from the rest of the body that doesn't belong to the brain. And they will activate other microglia and kill brain cells. And all of this will further trigger inflammation. Neuroinflammation will also get more glutamate released and it will inhibit uh, reuptake by astrocytes. So more glutamate. It will also push more calcium through the NMD receptors. I think that is through um, an effect on the NR2B subunits. I can't remember right now. And it will reduce GABA inhibition by acting on chloride co-transport uh, chloride transporters. And 
it will get more reactive oxygen species released. So when we look at this picture, we can almost see there's a vortex or a vicious cycle of mechanisms that enhance each other and trigger each other. Um, so before I stop this 15 minutes <laughs> lesson on <laughs> mechanism in brain disorders, I wanted to add a little bit on behavior at the end because Behaviors is, is what we see as parents at home, and we all always wonder why is that. So neuroinflammation is in itself a cause sickness behavior, uh, but it was also cause something called tryptophan metabolism to be skewed. And tryptophan goes through two pathways, and one pathway is going to serotonin in the brain. And when it gets skewed, we will get brain serotonin depletion, which will cause behavioral abnormalities. And this has been tested in autism. And uh, what we see then is whirling, flapping, hand flapping, pacing, banging, hitting self, rocking, and toe walking. And I'm sure there are parents here who have seen some of these behaviors at home. It will also make skew the cunarinine pathway. And that one is very interesting because it some of the meta metabolites there are agonists or antagonists on the NMD receptor. And of course, the NMD receptor is linked to the dopamine 1 receptor, so we will see dopamine issues too. Wow, that was a lot to take in on 15 minutes. And I'm afraid there are parents out there who are not thinking wow about this, but oh my god, is all of this happening to our kids? What are we gonna do? And I can assure you, I wouldn't tell you about this if it was bad news, but actually there are many possibilities for us to act on this. And I'll show you how. Today, we have our clever researchers who are looking at brain disorders from this viewpoint. And they are gonna find some really nice uh, treatments for our kids. Um, but as a parent, when I look at this box, I feel like the number of uh, possible treatments is not that big. So what I think is that the rest of us, in the meantime, maybe could take a broader view on the issues and maybe we'll find other treatments that are applicable to green disorders. Because there are so many solutions out there that have been used or trialed uh, for these mechanisms in other disorders. And here's just a few ones that I find promising or interesting. Uh, and several of them have been trialed on children. And I even think we have people in the community who have tried some of these. So by looking at green disorders this way, we can understand why the treatments we've tried so far may not suffice. One example would be the anti-epileptic drugs that do not always work for green disorders. Maybe we need to address mitochondria, inflammation or oxidative stress and not just the EI balance. And we will be able to find new solutions that solve certain symptoms. And I'm not talking about cures but how to raise quality of life as soon as possible for our kids and for our families. And some of these solutions will have an impact on several mechanisms at once. I'm a fan of flavonoids because they are so broadly acting and many solutions will amplify each other. So it's really a divide and conquer strategy and it's useful for anyone. I believe any parent can read up on these mechanisms. And you don't need to be a research for that. Uh, you might become one <laughs> though. And the greatest answer may not lie where we expect to find them. Just because we call brain disorders neurological today, we don't know about the metabolic or immunologic impact yet. Until we know which mechanisms are the most important ones, we need people to turn every stone out there. And maybe you can turn one stone for the team. 
Thank you for listening. My acknowledgement goes to parents, bloggers, inventors, biohackers, and researchers who thought me it's stuff that neither school nor literature can. And you can reach out to me either on Facebook or on my email below. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny Lee. This was, um, this was truly awesome. Um, maybe we should do this like on a regular basis with you. <laughs> <laughs> like have this Jenny Lee uh, corner uh, in our uh, Facebook uh, Green Research Group. <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay, I think we have like five minutes uh, for questions. And um, Sandra, would you, would you please um, take over the question part? Because I haven't been following um, the Q&A. Yes, um, actually I was trying to look for questions that were pertaining to what we were discussing. Um, oh, maybe I'll, I'll read this one, but uh, I think we can leave it open for anybody to answer. Um, I just wanted to check that ketamine, et cetera, are inhib in inhibiting. So therefore are appropriate for uh, gain of function green patients? Yes. I would, I, yeah, I, I agree, uh, but we just have to remember that there are so many side effects that are unwanted uh, with the with ketamine, and the effect is very short-lasting. Uh, so it's uh, it's not a it, it's not a good uh, compound if you want to treat something that is uh, long-lasting. The ketamine effect wears off in uh, uh, an hour. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, um, well, then I'm going to keep on reading a few and, and whoever of the panelists are here want to intervene, that would be great. Um, I, there's another uh, comment here. My eight-year-old grandson has a green one uh, gain of function. He, his only seizures are febrile seizures. Um, uh, is there a relationship to epilepsy? Well, I guess the, the epilepsy not caused by the febrile seizures. Um, besides memantine, is there any other protocol uh, currently being used for the treatment of gain of function? May I take it? We can leave that one for the round table discussion then. Sandra, there's one uh, specifically for Chartan. I think it's from Chavi. Uh, maybe we should start with that um, okay. and leave the rest for the round table discussion, maybe. Mm -hmm. Do you, you want, want to read, read that? Oh. Sorry. Um, yes, uh, Chartan, thank you for your great talk. Several green mouse models are currently available and many others are in progress. Does Lumbeck uh, consider the possibility to adapt EEG recording devices for the mouse models. Alternatively, are you considering the possibility to create green rat models? As far as I know, the green 2A head rat is available, which are particularly interesting in terms of neuronal and behavioral phenotypes. Thank you. Yes. So uh, it's, uh, it's not a problem to run EEG in, in mice. Uh, we, we do that at Lundbeck. Um, and yeah, mice are more accessible for, uh, for uh, mutational uh, models, but there are also some rat models. We don't generate uh, models ourselves, uh, uh, but if we can access them uh, and it can help us, we we'll, we'll use them. It's, uh, it's just the, the mouse is so much smaller, uh, so you really have to be careful how much weight you put on the, on the head. Um, but it's it's uh, it's uh, doable uh, both to put screws uh, in the skull and also uh, depth electrodes. You can do that. Oh, it looks very sci-fi. That <laughs> it's well, just a cartoon, <laughs> but that's kind of how it looks. Well, thank you to both of you, Jenny Lee. Also, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. I think we all enjoy it, and we might have some more questions later on for both of you. Mm -hmm.